UFC Fight Night Rebus vs. Nami Yunez is this Saturday, and for each fight, including the prelims, I'm going to give a brief introduction to each fighter, compare their stats, review their recent fight history, analyze the results of each of my seven data science prediction models, give a combined weighted prediction of those models, and then give my final prediction which considers both quantitative and qualitative information combined. At the end of the video, I'll even show you bets that show promise based on everything we've reviewed along with their odds, probabilities, and returns. Hopefully you can use these predictions and data to confirm your picks, avoid mistakes, and find some value bets, or for just entertainment and information to prepare for this upcoming event. Please like and subscribe if you find this interesting, informative, or helpful as it helps keep me motivated in creating these videos for you all. Running this data and analysis, each of the prediction models, fight simulations, charts and graphs, and updating the site takes hours every day and week, so I'd really appreciate the support. And thank you all for the recent support that you have shown. I can't believe I'm over 200 subscribers. I was just at 30 like a week or two ago. This truly means the world to me that you're all here and we can all share our passion together for MMA and build a community together. So let's go ahead and jump right in. In the first fight, we have Mohamed Usman versus Mick Parkin. Let me give you a brief introduction to these fighters. Mohamed Usman, originally from Nigeria, boasts a powerful wrestling background that he seamlessly blends with his striking game in the octagon. Known for his relentless pressure and ground control, Usman is a force to be reckoned with. On the other side, we have Mick Parkin, a tough fighter from England who favors a boxing-centric style with heavy hands and precise footwork. Parkin's ability to dictate the pace of the fight and land significant strikes has earned him respect among fans and competitors alike. Now let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Mohamed Usman standing 6 feet 2 inches tall with a 79 inch reach shows a methodical approach with a significant strikes per minute rate of 2.92 and an accuracy of 40%. His defense against significant strikes is at 52% while absorbing an average of 3.96 per minute. Grappling is a part of his strategy, as seen by his takedown average of 1.26, though his takedown accuracy is at 18%, with a low takedown defense. Now let's go ahead and check out how Mohamed Usman has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Usman is on a three-fight winning streak, showcasing his ability to win both by decision and via knockout. His most recent bout against Jake Collier ended in a unanimous decision victory, displaying his capacity to last the full fight duration and secure the victory on the scorecards. His knockout win against Zach Poga highlighted his power, ending the fight in just 36 seconds with a punch. He was on the Ultimate Fighter 30 semifinals Nunes vs. Pena, where he beat Eduardo Perez via split decision. Prior to that, he was in Titan FC for a few fights, Victory FC for one fight, and Tachi Palace fights for a couple fights. Now let's check out how his opponent Mick Parkin has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Parkin is also on a winning streak, consistently demonstrating his skills over the full course of the fight with two unanimous decision victories. His ground game is also a weapon that he has, as he secured a win with a rear naked choke submission against Eduardo Neves, which indicated versatility in striking and grappling domains. Prior to his Dana White Contender Series victory against Eduardo Neves and his two UFC fight night victories against Chao Machado and Jamal Pogues, he fought at Rise and Conquer, Olympus FC, Cage Steel FC, and Almighty FC. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. One model shows a split preference, but most overwhelmingly favor Mick Parkin, with the neural network and gradient boosting models indicating a strong likelihood of a Parkin victory at 73 and 58% respectively. Usman's only favored in the 1000 fight simulations at a 65% probability. Now, when you weigh the models together, the prediction leans towards Parkin with a 62% probability of winning. My final prediction, which is slightly lower than the weighted predictions, is that Mick Parkin has a 59% probability of defeating Mohamed Usman. Parkin's higher striking volume and accuracy, his proven grappling ability, and his better takedown defense should be enough to get him the win and outwork Usman. The most likely method of victory could be a decision win, as Parkin has shown he can control fights and win on the scorecards. Usman may not be able to outstrike his opponents. Even the three I showed you earlier, he did not have more strikes than either of them, but he is able to get takedowns and still control fights. It may not be in the most dominant fashion, but it's enough to sway the fight in his favor unanimously. Parkins will have to be aware of that and strategize and adjust accordingly throughout the fight. In the next fight, we have Igor Da Silva versus Andre Lima. Let me give you a brief introduction to these fighters. Igor Da Silva is a Brazilian mixed martial artist known for his aggressive fighting style and background in Muay Thai. De Silva brings a relentless pace to his fights, often overwhelming his opponents with powerful combinations. On the other hand, Andre Lima is also from Brazil and is a versatile fighter with a background in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. 
Lima's fights are characterized by his technical grappling skills and ability to seamlessly transition between striking and submissions, making him a challenging opponent in any aspect of the fight game. Now let's take a look at their stats. Igor Da Silva and Andre Lima both stand at 5 feet 7 inches tall. Both are relatively young fighters, with Igor at 20 years old and Andre being 25. They have similar reach as well, with Igor having a 69 inch reach and Andre just 2 inches shorter at 67 inches. Now, just to give you guys some context before we dive into their stats, their fight stats come from one fight each, both of which were in Dana White's Contender Series. Igor showed a high rate of strikes landed per minute at 9.85 in his fight against John Ta Silva, compared to Andre's rate of 4.07 when he faced Rickson Zenedim, which hints that Igor is more active in delivering strikes during a fight. However, Igor's striking accuracy was lower at 55%, while Andre hit a significant accuracy of 66%, potentially indicating he's more precise with his strikes. When it comes to absorbing punishment, Igor's stats show that he received more, with a strikes absorbed per minute rate of 4.86 against Andre's rate of 1.67, but Igor's striking defense is slightly higher at 47% over Andre's 40%. The takedown stats are where Igor stands out with a whopping 9.85 takedown average per 15 minutes. Andre, on the other hand, has a takedown average of 1, and he was able to take down Rickson Zenedim successfully. Now let's check out how Igor Da Silva performed in that Dana White Contender Series fight back in September 19, 2023. He secured a victory by KO such TKO using punches against Jonata Silva in the second round at 2 minutes and 37 seconds. The victory was marked by a high number of strikes, with Igor landing 75 strikes and achieving 5 takedowns, which showcased his aggressive and dominant fighting style. Igor also managed to knock down his opponent twice, further highlighting his power and ability to control the fight. Prior to that event, he won four fights in a row in jungle fight events in various ways. He beat Manuel Rodriguez via KO slash TKO for the Jungle Fight Flyweight Championship and has secured victories via submission as well, four total to be exact, including through north-south chokes, guillotines, armbars, and rear naked chokes. His professional record is 8-0 and he's finished all opponents. He's had a very promising career and is only 20 years old, which is insane. Now let's check out how his opponent, Andre Lima, has performed in his most recent fight. Like I mentioned earlier, Andre faced Rickson Zenedim at Dana White's Contender Series, which was back in October 10, 2023. Andre won this match by unanimous decision after three rounds, which indicates his ability to maintain a performance throughout the full fight's duration. He landed 61 strikes and secured a takedown, with no submission attempts on either side. Prior to that fight, he fought at LFA, where he KO slash TKO'd Igor Talon, Round 1 fighting where he defeated Alexandre Rodriguez and Spartacus MMA where he secured 3 KO slash TKOs and a unanimous decision victory. His record is 7-0 and he's also had a very promising career at only 25 years old. This is a pretty big fight honestly, especially if you're a fan of young rising talent. The key that Lima brings to the table is his endurance. By outclassing two of his opponents through three rounds and earning the unanimous decision, as well as getting multiple KOs slash TKOs, he's not someone you want to have a standing battle with. It's important to note that despite all of this, he doesn't have any submission wins, which we know Igor Da Silva has plenty. This could create an interesting fight dynamic where we could see how they use these strengths and embed them within their strategies through the fights. Unfortunately, due to the lack of data, I wasn't able to put both of these fighters through the prediction models. We'll see a few of those scenarios in this video, since this card has a lot of talent that's new to the UFC and rising in MMA. The odds point to a 58% probability of victory for Andre Lima. I do predict that Andre Lima will win due to his precision in striking, his solid defense, and his proven ability to win fights that go the distance. Considering the stats from recent fights and the stats that are available, the most likely method of victory could be a decision, as Andre is more of a strategic fighter that can control the pace of a fight and last through all rounds. I think that his background in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu should keep him safe if the fight goes to the mat. In the next fight, we have Montserrat Rendon versus Daria Zaleznikova. Let me give you a brief introduction to these fighters. Montserrat Rendon was born and raised in Mexico and brings a gritty and aggressive fighting style into the octagon, with a strong emphasis on striking and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Known for her durability and tenacity, Rendon is never one to back down from a challenge in this division. On the flip side, we have Daria Zaleznikova, a talented fighter who showcases a dynamic Muay Thai style coupled with a good ground game. Zaleznikova's technical precision and explosive striking make her a truly challenging opponent that's capable of controlling and even finishing fights. Now let's take a look at their stats. Montserrat Rendon stands at 5 feet 8 inches tall with a reach that's equal to her height. 
She is 35 years old and has plenty of experience in MMA in just the last four years alone. It's important to note that the stats I'm showing you are from only one UFC Fight Night fight, which was at the Fizia vs. Gamrock card back in September 2023, where she had defeated Tamiris Vidal via split decision. I'll discuss her fights prior to that a little bit later after these stats. Her striking per minute rate in that fight was 4.6, and her striking accuracy was at 37%, so she landed more than a third of her attempts. However, she absorbed 4 strikes per minute, which is concerning in terms of striking defense. So she pretty much gets hit as often as she lands, which isn't a good sign. Diving a little bit deeper into that, she has a striking defense of 44%, so she avoids less than half of the strikes thrown at her, which could be a risk against a precise striker. Her takedown average was 3, and her takedown accuracy was 60%, so she has a decent grappling ability. She also defended three takedowns that Tamiris Vidal threw in that fight. On the other hand, we have Daria Zelesnikova, and she's making her UFC debut, so we don't have much stats on her. What we do know is that she's one inch taller and seven years younger than Montserrat Rendon, and we also know that her professional record is eight wins and one loss, and that she's finished five fights via KO slash TKO, with the other three being wins via unanimous decision. Her one loss was via KO slash TKO. So she's tall, she's young, and she has knockout power. That's a bit dangerous for Montserrat considering she absorbed a relatively high number of strikes per minute. But let's check out how Montserrat Rendon has performed in her most recent UFC fights. As I mentioned earlier, she only has that one fight against Tamiris Vidal, which she did win. In that fight, Rendon landed a significant number of strikes, 69 total, and executed three successful takedowns, but no knockdowns or submission attempts. While she may control fights, she lacks finishing power in a submission game. I say this because out of her 6 wins in her 6-0 record, 4 were via unanimous decision and 2 were via split decisions. And to make matters a little bit worse, the split decisions were the more recent UFC fights, one being Tamiris Vidal and the other being Brittany Cloudy in Invicta FC. Prior to that, she had a fight against Claudia Zamora in Jorge Masvidal's Gamebred Fighting Championship, and prior to that, she had a couple fights in Combat Global and Fearless MMA. Although she's not much of a finisher, she does have the endurance and striking ability to take the fight to the distance and still win, as we've seen. Now let's talk about Daria Zelesnikova's record. Although she's making her debut, she's previously had a few fights in Ares FC, a couple fights in Open Fighting Championship, one of which was for the OFC Bantamweight Championship, one fight in MMA Series, and a few fights in GIT Sec Pro. Her eight wins came within the last four years, so she's been pretty active. Five of her eight wins were via KO slash TKO, which is also how she got her one and only loss, and she has three unanimous decision victories. She has powerful hands, and even when she can't drop her opponents, she can outstrike them and win via decision. Unfortunately, I couldn't put these two fighters through the prediction models due to the debut of Daria. However, the odds are favoring Daria Zelesnikova with a 59% chance of winning. My prediction is that Daria Zelesnikova will defeat Montserrat Rendon, and the likely method of victory will be via KO slash TKO. I could see Daria coming out and trying to make a statement in her debut, and you have to think, if she was able to land all those knockouts, and we know Montserrat tends to absorb strikes and defend less than half the strikes that come at her, Daria will inevitably land a finishing strike. In the next fight, we have Jarno Ahrens versus Steven Wynn. Let me give you a brief introduction to these fighters. Jarno Ahrens, originally from the Netherlands, is a skilled kickboxer with a background in Muay Thai, known for his precise striking and devastating kicks. With a relentless attacking style and solid defensive skills, Ahrens is a formidable force in this division, always pushing the pace and looking for the finish. On the other hand, we have Steven Wynn, a talented martial artist from Dallas, Texas in the United States, who brings a well-rounded skill set into the cage combining elements of boxing, wrestling, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Wynn's versatility and adaptability make him a dangerous opponent in this division, capable of capitalizing on opportunities wherever they arise. Now let's take a look at their stats. Jarno Ahrens and Steven Wynn both stand at 5 feet 11 inches tall with an identical reach of 73 inches, which should make for an even match in terms of reach advantage. Ahrens at 29 years old is a year younger than Wynn. Ahrens' stats show a striking per minute rate of 1.67, which is relatively low, especially when compared to Wynn's 8.29 striking per minute rate, so Wynn is far more active in the striking department. Aaron's striking accuracy is at 38%, which is fairly close to Wynn's 43%, indicating a similar capacity to land significant strikes. However, Wynn's higher striking accuracy is complemented by his much higher activity rate. Aaron's absorbs 2.93 strikes per minute, whereas Wynn absorbs a higher rate at 7.49, which is a result of his aggressive style. 
Defensively, Wynn shines with a striking defense of 63% over Aaron's is 52%, indicating Wynn is better at avoiding incoming strikes. In terms of grappling, Stephen Wynn has a higher takedown defense at 83% compared to Aaron's is 33%. Now let's check out how Jarno Aaron's has performed in his most recent fights. He has had a tough run with two consecutive losses. His most recent fight against Seung Woo Choi at UFC Fight Night Holloway vs. the Korean Zombie ended in a unanimous decision against him. Seung Woo Choi was able to outstrike Aaron's and even landed a takedown. Before that fight, he faced William Gomez at UFC Fight Night, Gon vs. Tuivasa, also losing by unanimous decision, being outstruck and taken down three times. Aaron's UFC record suggests he has difficulty when fights go the distance, relying more on striking than grappling, and has yet to show that he can dominate in the octagon to sway the judges. He's fought in all sorts of promotions like Brave CF, NFC, UAE Warriors, and the list goes on. His full record is 13 wins, 5 losses, and 1 draw. He's gotten 5 submissions, but it's been 4 years since his last one. Now let's check out how his opponent, Steven Wynn, has performed in his most recent fights. Wynn appears to be on a stronger trajectory, with two of his recent fights resulting in wins, one via KO slash TKO and one through unanimous decision. He defeated AJ Cunningham and Theo Ray Yang, both in Dana White's Contender Series. His striking volume is notably high, and he doesn't shy away from engaging with his opponents. His loss to Alan Cruz, however, came from a flying knee, which indicates that while he's aggressive, he may be susceptible to attacks during exchanges. In between his loss and his win, he got a win at LFA against Jorge Juarez via KO. Prior to these fights, he was in EFC and has a fight in Shamrock FC as well. In that time, he secured three submissions. His total record is nine wins and one loss. He secured four KO slash TKOs and three submissions, which is pretty impressive overall. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to put these two through the prediction models either as they lack UFC data, but the odds are predicting a victory for Steven Wynn with a 63% probability. I do believe he gets it done here, especially considering the momentum he is bringing and the lack of momentum that Aaron's is bringing. And to be honest, in those two losses, Aaron's was outclassed. And given Wynn's striking volume and history of finishes, he'll most likely get the KO slash TKO against Aaron's. Aaron's will need to improve his defense and find a way to counter Wynn's high striking output to stand a chance in this fight. Wynn's aggressive and high volume striking will probably get the job done in this fight. In the next fight, we have Miles Johns versus Cody Gibson. Let me give you a brief introduction to each of these fighters. Miles Johns, fighting out of Texas, brings a gritty wrestling background into the cage, combined with sharp striking skills. His relentless pressure and well-rounded game make him a challenging opponent for anyone in this division. On the other hand, we have Cody Gibson, a Californian known for his explosive striking and submission ability. Gibson's aggressive style and knockout power have earned him the respect in the MMA community, making him a thrilling fighter to watch every time he steps into the octagon. Now let's take a look at their stats. Miles Johns and Cody Gibson present a fascinating matchup when we break down their stats. Johns stands at 5 feet 7 inches tall with a reach of 66 inches, while Gibson has a height advantage at 5 feet 10 inches tall and a reach advantage at 71 inches. Johns lands an average of 3.51 significant strikes per minute with an accuracy of 48%, but he absorbs 2.75 strikes per minute and has a striking defense of 68%. Comparatively, Gibson has a higher strikes landed per minute rate at 4.75 and a comparable striking accuracy of 45%. His strikes absorbed per minute rate is also higher at 4.73 with a lower striking defense of 55%. For takedowns, Johns averages 1.03 with an accuracy of 21% and a superb defense at 85%. Gibson, on the other hand, averages more takedowns at 1.35 but has a higher accuracy of 35% and a slightly lower defense at 64%. Neither fighter is really known for their submission attempts, with John averaging 0 and Gibson slightly higher at 0.3. These numbers show John as more of a defensively oriented fighter with a strong takedown defense, while Gibson is more offensively productive, both on the feet and in grappling exchanges. Now let's check out how Miles Johns has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Johns recently had a unanimous decision victory that was overturned against Dan Argetta due to being tested for M3 metabolite, which is found in DHCMT, or oral turinabol, which is an anabolic steroid. That fight was back in September, and he was suspended for about four and a half months, and now he's illegible to fight again. Before that fight, he secured a unanimous decision victory against Vince Morales, but took a loss to John Castaneda, via a arm triangle submission, which might indicate potential vulnerability in his grappling, though it's his only loss in his last four fights. 
His wins against Anderson Dos Santos and Kevin Natividad, both by KO slash TKO with punches, demonstrate his knockout power and that he can end fights early. Now let's check out how his opponent, Cody Gibson, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. It's been a rough patch for Gibson when it comes to UFC fights, with three consecutive losses all via unanimous decision. It's important to note that he fought in the UFC in 2014 and 2015, then went to the Warriors Cage, Tachi Palace Fights, LFA, XMMA, Eagle FC, and Up Next Fighting, and then returned to the Ultimate Fighter last year where he submitted Rico Disculio. Then he fought Brad Katana a few days later at UFC 292 Sterling vs. O'Malley, where he lost via unanimous decision. His striking stats were high in a few fights, especially against Brad Katana and Manvel Gumbarian, but that didn't really translate to wins, unfortunately. In between his departure from the UFC and his return to the UFC, he won about seven fights and lost only two. Most of his wins were via unanimous decision, and two were via KO slash TKO, and his losses were via submission and unanimous decision. He has a mixed record overall, but is someone that can go the distance, and when he does, he wins more times than he loses. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weight of results, and my final prediction. The prediction models show an interesting spread. Johns is favored across the board with some high probability predictions such as the random forest model with 76% and the neural network model with 72%. The model favors his overall skill set, his youth, and his fight history. When you weigh all of the models together, the weighted prediction is a 62% probability for Miles Johns to get the victory. My final prediction, which is slightly lower than the weighted predictions, is that Miles Johns has a 60% probability of defeating Cody Gibson due to his superior striking defense, takedown defense, and his ability to finish fights with knockouts and go the distance, as shown in his recent fight history. The most likely method of victory that I see will be a decision victory given Johns' demonstrated striking skill set and Gibson's trend of losing by decision rather than being finished. In the next fight, we have Ricardo Ramos versus Julian Arosa. Let me give you a brief introduction to each of these fighters. Ricardo Ramos is a native of Brazil, and he showcases a dynamic fighting style rooted in capoeira and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, blending flashy strikes with slick submissions. With his creative approach and ability to finish fights from any position, Ramos presents a unique challenge in this division. Julian Arosa is from the United States and is a gritty fighter known for his aggressive Muay Thai and relentless pressure inside the cage. Arosa's durability and willingness to engage in exciting exchanges makes him a fan favorite, capable of turning any fight into a barn burner in this division. Now let's take a look at their stats. Ricardo Ramos is 5 feet 9 inches tall with a 72 inch reach, while Julian Arosa towers at 6 feet 1 inch tall and has a 2 inch reach advantage. At 28 years old, Ramos is 6 years younger than Arosa, so while Arosa has experience, Ramos has youth. Ramos has a strike slanted permanent rate of 3.21, which is a moderate striking output, but it pales in comparison to Arosa's aggressive rate of 6.22. Arosa is the more offensive fighter in the stand-up game. Ramos has a striking accuracy of 37% against Arosa's higher 48%, suggesting Arosa not only throws more, but he lands more effectively. Defensively, Ramos absorbs fewer strikes per minute and has a higher striking defense. He has more evasive maneuvers and head movement than Arosa does. Ramos also shows versatility with a decent takedown average and takedown accuracy, which demonstrates his capability to bring the fight to the ground, whereas takedown defense is also robust at 72%. His submission average is slightly higher than Arosa's as well, hinting at a more varied approach to his ground game. Now let's check out how Ricardo Ramos has performed in his most recent UFC fights. His record is mixed with two wins and three losses. He showcased a spectacular knockout against Danny Chavez with a spinning back elbow but fell to Charles Jourdain via a guillotine choke in his most recent fight. His fights seem to either end early or go the distance, and he has this kill-or-be-killed fighting style. The stats show he's more than capable on the ground and standing, but his mixed results suggest he might struggle against fighters who can match his versatility. Now let's check out how his opponent, Julian Arosa, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Arosa has also had a mix of outcomes with two recent losses, both by knockout, indicating a possible vulnerability to powerful strikes. However, he also has secured wins, including a submission victory over Steven Peterson and a unanimous decision against Hakim Dawoodu. Arosa seems to have a high output with significant strikes, but may run the risk of getting caught while being aggressive. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The models show a unanimous lean towards Ricardo Ramos, with probabilities ranging from 51 to as high as 72% across various methods like linear regression, neural networks, and support vector machines. 
the weighted model's prediction consolidates this at 63% weighted probability, showing confidence in Ramos's overall ability to win. My final prediction aligns closely with the weighted models, giving Ramos an ever so slightly less confident 62% probability to secure the victory over Julian Arosa, giving a bit of respect to Arosa's striking stats and what he has previously been capable of doing not too long ago. Given the statistical analysis and recent fight history, the most likely method of victory could come through Ramos's more balanced approach, perhaps utilizing his ground game to offset Arosa's striking volume. Considering Arosa's recent knockout losses, Ramos may also seek to exploit any defensive lapses while strategically and aggressively throwing strikes. Arosa's path to victory would likely involve maintaining pressure with his striking while avoiding the takedown threat posed by Ramos. Bottom line, I think Ramos could get the finish here. In the next fight, we have Kurt Holaba versus Trey Ogden. Let me give you a brief introduction to these two. Kurt Holaba, a Louisiana native, is a well-rounded mixed martial artist known for his aggressive striking and solid grappling skills. With a background in wrestling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Holaba brings a relentless pace to the octagon, always looking to push the action and finish the fight. On the other hand, we have Trey Ogden, a talented fighter from Kansas who excels in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai. Ogden's technical proficiency and strategic approach make him a tough opponent to face in this division, capable of capitalizing on any openings to secure a victory. Now let's take a look at their stats. Both Kurt Holaba and Trey Ogden stand at 5 feet 11 inches tall, but Ogden has a slight 2 inch reach advantage. At 37 years old, Holaba is older than the 34 year old Ogden, and I know 3 years may not seem like a big difference, but 3 years in MMA, especially when you compare a 34 year old and a 37 year old, is definitely a difference to note. Age in MMA is an interesting bittersweet conflict of experience and a negative impact to endurance and skill. Holaba boasts a higher strikes landed per minute rate at 4.89 compared to Ogden's 3.64, indicating he is the more active striker. Holaba's striking accuracy is slightly lower than Ogden's, but they're both fairly similar, landing a respectable amount of their strikes. Holaba absorbs slightly more strikes per minute than Ogden does, which might be a result of his more aggressive style, but it's not too big of a difference. It's 4.44 versus 4.02. In terms of defense, Ogden shows a higher striking defense percentage at 58%, potentially giving him the edge in avoiding damage. Holaba's takedown average is much lower than Ogden's, but he's more accurate with them, averaging a takedown accuracy of 36% versus 16%. Both fighters have a modest submission average, with Holaba slightly higher, indicating they're capable of submission attempts during the fight, but it's not their primary focus. Now let's check out how Kurt Holaba has performed in his most recent UFC fights. He's had a tough streak with three losses, followed by a win in his most recent fight against Austin Hubbard via a triangle choke submission, which shows that he can finish fights on the ground. The losses vary, with one being a unanimous decision against Tiago Moises and the other being an armbar submission from Shane Burgos, and the last one being a KO slash TKO against Rayoni Barcelos. He has vulnerabilities in both grappling defenses and striking defense, but his recent win suggests a shift in momentum. His record points to an all-or-nothing style, either securing the win early or finding himself on the losing end. Now let's check out how his opponent, Trey Ogden, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Ogden's recent fight history is quite varied, with a win, two losses, and a fight that was overturned recently with Nicholas Moda, where Mike Beltran had called the fight early, even though Moda was resisting the choke that Ogden had set up. I felt bad for Ogden in that outcome. His unanimous decision victory over Daniel Zellhuber shows he can go the distance and maintain performance throughout all rounds. He threw almost 20 strikes and landed a takedown there. His losses were to Ignacio Bahamondes at UFC 287 last year and Jordan Leavitt two years ago. He struggles against opponents that throw really high volume. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. Six out of seven prediction models lean towards Kurt Holaba, with him being favored by models such as the Random Forest and Neural Network models at 68 and 73% respectively, but others like the logistic regression model show a little bit less confidence in him. The gradient boosting model is the only model that favors Trey Ogden and gives him a 61% probability of winning. Now when we weigh the models together, Holaba is expected to win with a 62% probability. However, in my final prediction, I'm going against the models here and favoring Trey Ogden to win with a 53% probability. While Holaba may have the edge in activity and finish ability, Ogden's recent performances and better defensive statistics give him a slight edge in my opinion. 
Ogden's chances might be better if he can avoid Hollabaugh's power strikes and employ a strategy that plays to his defensive strengths, potentially leading to a victory by decision. Hollabaugh's path to victory would likely involve leveraging his striking volume to overwhelm Ogden and look for a finish either standing or on the ground. But at the end of the day, I don't think Hollabaugh will be able to defeat Ogden. Ogden gets it done and it goes to the judges for a decision. In the next fight, we have Fernando Padilla versus Luis Pajuelo. Let me give you a brief introduction to these two. Fernando Padilla, a talented Mexican fighter, is a dynamic mixed martial artist known for his explosive striking and aggressive grappling. With a background in wrestling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Padilla brings a well-rounded skill set into the cage, always looking to finish the fight with his relentless pressure and his heavy hands. On the other hand, we have Luis Pajuelo, a talented fighter from Peru who showcases a technical Muay Thai style coupled with solid defensive grappling. Pajuelo's precision striking and counterattacking prowess makes him a formidable opponent in the featherweight division, capable of outmaneuvering his opponents and securing victories with calculated strikes. Now let's take a look at their stats. Fernando Padilla stands at 6 feet 1 inch tall, which is 3 inches taller than Luis Pajuelo, who stands at 5 feet 10 inches tall. Padilla also has a significant reach advantage at 76 inches, which is a whopping 7 inches more than Pajuelo's 69 inches. This could give Padilla a distinct advantage in maintaining distance and using his range effectively in the fight. Both fighters are quite young, with Padilla at 27 years old and Pajuelo at 29. It's important to note that Padilla's stats come from only two fights, which were both UFC fight nights, where Pajuelo's stats only come from one fight, which was against Robbie Ring in Dana White's Contender Series. In those fights, Padilla had a high strike slanted per minute rate at 5.51, demonstrating an active striking game, but his striking accuracy was on the lower side at 38%. He throws a ton of volume, but with less precision. Pajuelo's stats indicate he's an extremely precise striker, with a striking accuracy of 61%, although he does so at a much higher output of 9.15 strikes slanted per minute too, which is impressive. Defensively, Pajuelo seems to have a slight edge with a better striking defense percentage. Not much to discuss on the grappling side of these stats, except for the fact that both fighters have shown some takedown defense. Now let's check out how Fernando Padilla has performed in his most recent UFC fights. He has an even record with one win and one loss. His win came via knockout against Julian Arosa, which highlights his striking power. However, he suffered a loss against Kyle Nelson recently by unanimous decision, where he was outstruck. This suggests that while Padilla has finishing power, he can be outworked over the course of a fight leading to a decision against him. He previously fought in Fury FC, LFA, CXF, and KOTC. His total record is 15 wins and 5 losses, and he's gotten 5 KOTKOs in 8 submissions, so he's able to finish fights in several ways. All of his losses were via unanimous decision, so he doesn't really get finished either. Now let's check out how his opponent, Luis Pajuelo, has performed in his most recent fight. He faced Robbie Ring and secured a victory via knockout with the knee, which occurred in the first round at Dana White's Contender Series back in August 2023. He definitely has finishing capabilities. He's previously fought in FFC, where he got several KO TKOs and a few other promotions as well. His total record is 8 wins and 1 loss, and 7 of those wins were via KO slash TKO. His only loss was through a split decision against Mike Davidson back in 2021. He's a dangerous fighter that hits hard and does not waste time. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't put both of these fighters through the prediction models because of Luis Pajelo's UFC debut, but the odds are giving Fernando Padilla a 57% probability of winning. This one's a really tough one to call, honestly. Although the odds are pointing towards Padilla, I know Pajelo is fully capable of winning this fight too. Considering Padilla's 3-inch height advantage, his 7-inch reach advantage, his diverse history of wins, and his aggressive approach to fights, I think he gets it done here and defeats Pajuelo. I couldn't tell you who could win more fights if these guys win against each other 10 times. I'm slightly leaning towards Padilla winning, with the method of victory being a KO slash TKO, given his advantages and fighting history here. This one should be a fun one to watch, honestly. I do have respect for Luis Pajuelo's ability and skill, though, and I know this won't likely be an easy victory for Padilla. In the next fight, we have Billy Quarantillo versus Yusuf Zalal. Let me give you a brief introduction to each of these fighters. Billy Quarantillo, born in New York and fighting out of Florida, is a versatile mixed martial artist known for his aggressive striking and slick submissions. With a background in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and kickboxing, Quarantillo brings a relentless pace and a well-rounded skill set into the octagon, always looking to push the action and finish the fight. 
On the flip side, we have Yusuf Zalal, a skilled fighter from Morocco who showcases a technical striking style combined with solid grappling. Zalal's precision, striking, and fluid movement make him a dangerous opponent in this division, capable of outmaneuvering his opponents and securing victories with well-timed strikes or submissions. Now let's take a look at their stats. Both Billy Corintio and Yusuf Zalal stand at 5 feet 10 inches tall, but Zalal has a slight 2 inch reach advantage. Age could be a factor here as Corintio is 35 and has significantly more experience than the younger 27 year old Zalal, which could translate into cage wisdom, but on the other hand, Zalal is young and hungry. Corintio exhibits a higher strikes landed per minute rate at 7.71, dwarfing Zalal's 2.75. This shows Quarantillo is extremely active in terms of striking, but it comes with a cost. He also has a high strikes absorbed per minute rate at 5.61. His striking accuracy is good at 57%, which is commendable for his output. Zalal, while not as active, has a higher striking defense at 64%, suggesting he is more measured in exchanges and avoids strikes more effectively. Takedown stats are a bit split. Zalal lands more takedowns with a rate of 2.14 versus 1.31, at an accuracy of 31% versus 23%. On the other hand, Billy Quarantillo has a slightly better takedown defense. Both fighters have nearly identical submission averages, with Quarantillo having 1.2 versus Zalal having 1.1. Now let's check out how Billy Quarantillo has performed in his most recent UFC fights. He has an alternating record of wins and losses, with his latest being a unanimous decision win against Damon Jackson, where he outstruck him but was taken down three times. He also has a KO slash TKO win against Alexander Hernandez and one against Gabriel Benitez where he outstruck both of them as well and even landed multiple takedowns. His losses were against Edson Barboza who we know is very skilled and Shane Burgos. Quarantillo has been capable of finishing fights but also has had decision wins showing he can maintain pace for a full fight's duration or deliver finishing blows. However, his losses suggest that when he doesn't manage to impose his game, he can be overcome, often by fighters who can withstand his volume or even outmatch him on power. Now let's check out his opponent, Yusuf Zalal, and his performance in his most recent UFC fights. Zalal has struggled in his UFC career with a series of losses and a draw. He has gone the distance in most of these fights, indicating his endurance and ability to survive, but also suggesting he has difficulty imposing his will and securing the judge's favor. His last win in the UFC was by unanimous decision against Peter Barrett in 2020, in which he controlled the pace and used his range. Here's the light at the end of the tunnel, though. After his draw in the UFC in 2022 against Damon Blackshear, he went on to Sparta Combat League, where he got two KOTKO victories against Edwin Chavez and Jake Childers, both in round one, and then in Sparta 98 in August 2023, he got an arm triangle submission in the first round against Vadim Zadnipiriani. So he's improved his skill set in striking and grappling, and he's bringing a lot of momentum into this fight. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. Every single model leaned towards Billy Quarantillo. Gradient boosting in the 1000 fight simulations heavily favored Billy, giving him a 93% probability of victory. However, these prediction models are likely taking into account only the UFC data that Zalal had, which as we've discussed, his recent fights have been a completely different story for him. So although the weighted probability of all of these models is 64%, I'm going to knock that down a bit for Zalal's recent success outside of the UFC and say that my final prediction is a 61% probability for Billy Quarantillo to win. Considering Quarantillo's higher strikes landed per minute rate and striking accuracy, and the fact that out of his 18 professional wins, he's landed 8 KOs slash TKOs, I think he'll get the finish here and overwhelm Zalal. I do respect what Zalal has done recently and what he's capable of doing. In order for Zalal to win, he would need to manage distance effectively and exploit Quarantillo's aggressiveness by counter-striking and maintaining defensive solidity, utilizing his 2-inch reach advantage as well. This will be an interesting fight as well with high stakes for Zalal, who has a bit of a comeback story going on here. In the next fight, we have Peyton Talbot versus Cameron Simon. Let me give you a brief introduction to these fighters. Peyton Talbot, a native of the United States, is a dynamic striker with a background in boxing and Muay Thai, and he's known for his precise striking and his aggressive style. With lightning fast combinations and devastating kicks, Talbot brings a relentless energy into the cage, always looking to impose his will on his opponents in this division. On the other hand, we have Cameron Simon, a talented martial artist from South Africa who excels in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo. Simon's technical grappling skills and ability to control the pace of the fight makes him a formidable opponent in this division, capable of capitalizing on any openings to secure a victory. 
Now let me review their stats for you. Peyton Talbot is 5 feet 10 inches tall and has a 2 inch height advantage against Cameron Simon who is 5 feet 8 inches tall. Talbo also has a reach advantage of 3 inches, which could be a significant thing in their stand-up exchanges. Both fighters are young, Talbo being 25 years old and Simon being 23. Talbo boasts a higher strikes landed per minute rate at 6.66, showing he's very active in striking, and he also absorbs less strikes than Simon with a rate of 3.12 versus 3.24. Both fighters have decent striking accuracies, with Talbo slightly leading with an effective 51% versus 46%. Simon has a slightly better striking defense at 55% versus Talbo's 51%. He's a bit more cautious and evasive. In terms of takedowns, Simon averages 1 with a 36% accuracy and a 0.8 submission average, while when it comes to Talbo, he has a 88% takedown defense. Now let's check out how Peyton Talbo has performed in his most recent UFC fights. He's on a winning streak with two recent victories. He won his last fight against Nick Aguirre by rear naked choke submission, showing his capability to finish fights on the ground despite not landing a takedown in that fight. He's not someone you want to take down because he can shift the momentum in his favor and take advantage. His win prior to that was by unanimous decision against Reyes Cortez Jr. at Dana White's Contender Series, demonstrating that he can maintain a strong pace and win rounds over the full distance of a fight. He almost doubled the striking output that Reyes Cortez Jr. was able to put up. Prior to these two fights, he fought at Uriah Faber's A1 Combat for a few fights, and then he had a couple fights at Firepower Promotions prior to that. His total record is 7 wins, 5 of which have been KO slash TKOs, and 1 of which was a submission. He's a finisher and an exciting rising fighter. Now let's check out how his opponent, Cameron Simon, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Simon's record is quite impressive with a series of wins and only one recent unanimous decision loss, which was to Christian Rodriguez back in October 2023 at UFC Finite Yusa vs. Barboza. The takedown made the difference in that fight, and he was slightly outstruck as well. His victories include knockouts and a majority decision, indicating not only does he have the power to finish fights, but he also has the skills to outpoint his opponents over the duration of a fight. He's faced Terrence Mitchell, Mana Martinez, Steven Kozlau, and Joshua Wayne Kim, and he's outstruck all of them, landing many takedowns as well. All in all, he's a good fighter that's shown consistent performances, even in his loss to Christian Rodriguez. So let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weight of results, and my final prediction. The models show a split view with a slight edge to Talbo in the most of the models, except for the neural network model, which heavily favors Simon and the support vectors machine, which slightly leans towards Simon. Four models pick Peyton Talbo, and three models pick Cameron Simon. When you weigh them together, you get a 54% probability for Peyton Talbo to win. My final prediction is very similar, slightly less, with a 53% probability for Peyton Talbo to win. This will be a very competitive matchup due to Talbo's slight advantage in striking output in recent form. I gave him a narrow margin of victory because Simon has solid defense and a respectable knockout power, so he's more than capable of taking the win, especially if he can exploit any openings in Talbo's defense. The most likely method of victory here for Peyton Talbo could be by decision. I see this being a fun striking fight where both fighters go back and forth and Peyton takes the lead and controls the fight. In the next fight, we have Edmund Shabazian versus AJ Dobson. Let me give you a brief introduction to both of these guys. Edmund Shabazian is from the United States and is a dynamic striker with a background in judo known for his lightning-fast combinations and knockout power. His aggressive fighting style and versatility made him a rising star in this division. AJ Dobson, also from the United States, brings a blend of boxing and wrestling into the cage, utilizing his speed and agility to outmaneuver opponents. Dobson's relentless pressure and well-rounded skill set make him a dangerous threat in this division, also keeping fans on the edge of their seats. When it comes to their stats, we have Edmund Shabazian towering at 6 feet 2 inches tall with a 75 inch reach against AJ Dobson who stands 6 feet 1 inch tall with a slightly greater reach of 76 inches. Shabazian lands an average of 3.46 significant strikes per minute with a 51% accuracy, but absorbs a high rate of 4.13 strikes per minute and defends at 43%. Meanwhile, Dobson puts up more strikes per minute at 4.38, albeit with a lower striking accuracy of 47%, absorbs more at 5.25 per minute, and has a similar striking defense of 47%. Shabazian shows strength in grappling with a takedown average of 2.17 at 39% accuracy and a respectable 63% takedown defense, whereas Dobson has a lower takedown average of 1.82, but a significantly higher accuracy at 75%, 
and a nearly identical takedown defense of 64%. Submissions are more of a factor for Shabazian, with an average of 0.6, indicating a more diverse ground game compared to Dobson's 0.3. Now let's check out how Edmund Shabazian has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Shabazian's recent record is a mix, with a single win and four losses in his five most recent fights. His most recent fight resulted in a loss to Anthony Hernandez by KO slash TKO via elbows in the third round. Prior to that, he had a victory against Dalcha Langimbula with a KO slash TKO by punches, demonstrating his knockout capability. However, preceding fights show a trend of losses, two by KO slash TKO and one by unanimous decision, which may suggest areas that need improvement, especially in terms of striking defense and possibly endurance as the fights progress. Now let's check out how AJ Dobson has done in his most recent UFC fights. Dobson's record also shows a mixture of outcomes, but is slightly better. His last fight was a win against Tafon Chukwi via unanimous decision, showing he can go the distance. However, he has faced setbacks as well with two losses by unanimous decision before that, highlighting potential challenges and securing decisive victories. His earlier win with a submission by rear naked choke against Hashim Arkaga in Dana White's Contender Series back in 2021 indicates a threat he possesses on the ground if he can control the fight. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The odds favor Shabazian, and the prediction models generally agree, but there's some divergence. Logistic regression and support vector machines show strong confidence in Shabazian, with probabilities of 86% and 84% respectively. However, the 1000 fight simulation model seems to believe the fight is more evenly matched, given Dobson a 53% chance of victory. Other models hover around the 50-60% to 60 mark for Shabazian, suggesting a competitive fight. When you weigh all of these prediction model results together, you get Shabazian with a 63% probability to win. My final prediction aligns with the weighted models also at 63%. I believe based on everything we have and reviewed that Shabazian has a good chance of defeating Dobson. Considering Shabazian's higher striking rate and grappling stats, along with his knockout victory, the most likely method of victory could be a KO slash TKO, especially if he capitalizes on Dobson's higher strikes absorb per minute rate and keeps the fight standing, leveraging his striking skills. In the next fight, we have Carl Williams versus Justin Taffa. Let me give you a brief introduction to these two. Carl Williams is from the United States and brings a powerful boxing background into the ring, known for his heavy hands and his precise striking. With a knack for ending fights with knockout blows, Williams possesses a significant threat to anyone in this division. On the other side of the octagon will be Justin Taffa, who is from New Zealand and showcases a ferocious fighting style rooted in kickboxing, coupled with pretty good grappling skills. Taffa's explosive combinations and aggressive approach make him a thrilling competitor to watch, capable of ending fights in spectacular fashion. Looking at their stats, Carl Williams brings a significant stature to the cage at 6 feet 3 inches tall with a reach of 79 inches. In contrast, Justin Taffa stands at 6 feet with a 74 inch reach. Williams has a lower significant strikes per minute rate at 2.93 with a 49% striking accuracy and takes fewer hits, absorbing 1.8 significant strikes per minute while defending against 62% of strikes. Taffa, on the other hand, delivers more punches, averaging 5.13 significant strikes per minute, with a higher striking accuracy at 55%, but this comes with a downside as he absorbs a hefty 5.93 strikes per minute and has a lower striking defense at 49%, which is a pretty dangerous combination. Neither fighter has focused on submissions, but Williams shows a good grappling game with an average of 4 takedowns at a 46% accuracy. Now let's check out how Carl Williams has performed in his most recent UFC fights. He's currently on a winning streak with his most recent victories coming all by the way of unanimous decision. These stats show a fighter who knows how to control the pace and use his grappling to secure points with an outstanding 8 takedowns in his fight against Lucas Bresky. Williams relies less on finishing his opponents and more on outscoring and controlling them throughout the rounds, which is a strategy that has served him well thus far honestly. Now let's check out his opponent, Justin Taffa, and his performance in the UFC recently. Taffa's recent fight history shows he's a dangerous fighter and highlights his knockout power. He secured wins in three out of his last five fights, with all victories coming by KO slash TKO, proving he can end fights abruptly with heavy hitting hands and his impressive reach. His last fight was against Austin Lane, and it ended quickly in the first round with a devastating punch. 
However, he also has a loss by unanimous decision, which might hint at a gap when the fight goes the distance and against opponents that can employ a strategic control throughout the fight. That loss was by Jared Vendera, who outstruck Tafa 121 to 74. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the way to results in my final prediction. The models are showing a strong inclination towards Carl Williams, with the support vector machines and the 1000 fight simulations giving him an overwhelming probability of 93 and 99% respectively. The neural network and gradient boosting models also favor Williams significantly, while the linear regression and random forest models see it as somewhat more balanced but still lean towards Williams. These models are favoring Williams' grappling ability and his successful takedown defense against an opponent like Tafa. The weighted model's predictions put Williams at a 69% chance of winning. My final prediction is a bit more confident than the weighted models, with a 71% probability that Carl Williams will defeat Justin Taffa. Considering Williams' defensive stats and his ability to score with takedowns against Taffa's striking power, the most likely method of victory seems to be a unanimous decision victory in favor of Williams, assuming he can avoid Taffa's heavy hands and utilize his superior grappling and reach to control the fight. In the next fight, we have Amanda Rivas versus Rose Namajunas, our main event. Let me give you a brief introduction to each of these fighters. Amanda Rivas is a Brazilian fighter that brings a vibrant mix of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo into the mix. She also captivates fans with her energetic presence and compelling smile. Meanwhile, Rose Namajunas is from the United States and showcases an impressive blend of striking and grappling. She's known for her remarkable mental resilience and her inspiring ability to come back even stronger after facing challenges. Both fighters have made significant marks in their careers, engaging fans worldwide with their unique styles and sheer heart that they put into every battle. Now let's take a look at their stats. We have two accomplished fighters here with Amanda Riva standing at 5 feet 3 inches tall and Rose Namajunas standing at 5 feet 5 inches. Both fighters are in their prime with Rivas at 30 years old and Namajunas at 31. They're closely matched in reach as well with Rivas at 66 inches and Namajunas just an inch shorter at 65. Now looking at their striking, Rivas lands significantly more strikes per minute at 4.92 compared to Namajunas' 3.68. Rivas also has a slightly better striking accuracy, standing at 42% over Nami Yunus' 40%. Rivas absorbs fewer strikes per minute at 3.33 compared to Nami Yunus' 3.53, and their striking defense is nearly identical with Rivas at 63% and Nami Yunus at 62%. When it comes to grappling, Rivas seems to have the edge with a takedown average of 1.99 per 15 minutes against Nami Yunus' 1.49, and she also boasts a higher takedown accuracy. Impressively, Rivas has a superior takedown defense at 87% against Nami Yunus' 60%. Submission attempts are more frequent from Rivas as well, averaging 0.8 against Nami Yunus' 0.6. One of the things that stands out here is that Rivas shows a more aggressive grappling approach and a slightly more active striking game. She's just slightly better in all stats, which is pretty interesting. Now let's check out how Amanda Rivas has performed in her most recent UFC fights. She's shown to be a tough contender in the octagon with a recent record that's been a bit of a roller coaster. Rivas secured a knockout victory in her latest fight, which was against Luana Pinheiro, displaying her power. However, the fight before that didn't go her way with a second round knockout loss from Macy Barber, who is a tough competitor. This mix of outcomes continues in her fight history, with another win by unanimous decision and a loss by split decision, showing she can go the distance. Her record over these recent fights is 3 wins and 2 losses, and she seems to be comfortable both striking, as seen with her high significant strike counts and wins, and on the ground as well with consistent takedown attempts, reflecting a well-rounded skill set overall. Now let's look at Rose Nama Yunus's performance in her most recent UFC fights. Nama Yunus's recent track shows her to be a challenging fighter as well, though she's coming off of two consecutive decision losses against Manon Fioro and Carla Esparza. Before that, she claimed three back-to-back -back wins against Jessica Andrade and two wins against Zhang Wei Li. The first fight, she landed an impressive kick in the first round, which dropped Wei Li. When she faced her again, she won via split decision. She has diverse fighting capabilities. Her last five fights show a pattern of resilience, often going to the full number of rounds, which suggests she has crazy endurance and a fighting spirit that extends throughout the entirety of her matches. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final predictions. The models unanimously favor Amanda Rivas to win the fight. Confidence of the seven models range from 51% to 90% for Rivas. 
When you weigh the models together, they give Rebus a confident 68% probability. However, I believe that Rose Nama Yunus has a 52% probability of defeating Amanda Rebus due to her striking precision, her experience in high pressure fights, and her ability to go the distance in her matches. I just don't think the models are quite picking up on the caliber of opponents that Rose Nama Yunus has faced and defeated. I believe the fight will go the distance. I don't think Rose Nama Yunus has the ability to finish Amanda Rebus. She's not much of a finisher or heavy hitter. Nama Yunus has a proven track record of winning fights that last all rounds, and her striking defense could be the key to outlasting Rebus in a strategic battle that goes to the scorecards. Rebus has also lost to Macy Barber and Caitlin Sermonara, which shows that when she's put up against the more skilled fighter, she gets outstruck despite being able to land takedowns. She's an impressive fighter and this will be an interesting main event, but bottom line, I think Rose Namajunas takes it via unanimous decision. And with that, those are all of the fights for UFC Fight Night Rivas vs. Namajunas. Here are some potential bets that I think might be worthwhile to consider based on my final predictions, intuition, data science predictions, and both quantitative and qualitative information. I've provided the odds, the probability confidence percentages, and the returns based on those odds. I want to say genuinely thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe as it will help keep me motivated in creating these videos for you all. Running this data and analysis and prediction models and charts and graphs takes hours every day and week, so I'd really appreciate it. And again, sincerely, thank you all for getting me to 200 subscribers. I honestly never would have thought that I would have made it above 50 or something after several months, but I'm already at 200 and just two weeks ago I was at like 30, so that really means a lot to me and people have been so kind on here and showing support. I look forward to continuing to build a community with you all and just continuing to share our passion for MMA together. So I'm very excited for this Saturday and see you guys in the next one.